Welcome everyone to the Molecular Devices Automated Electrophysiology Webinar Series. Um, we, we have this webinar series to share data from internally our application scientists and with our, from our customers um, on a regular basis. So this is the tenth webinar in the webinar series and the webinars can be viewed uh, in the recorded state on our website. Today we have Shin Zhang with us, our application scientist um, at Molecular Devices. He'll be talking about uh, solution exchange rates and, and the complete exchange of solution in the recording chamber. And Glenn Kurtz will also be joining us from Chantes Corporation um, discussing a GABA assay that they've developed in-house. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with Shin first here. And Shin, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and um, pass you the ball. Okay. Jim, can you see my uh, slides? Yep, they look good. So thanks everyone for attending today's uh, webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you uh, some of the recent works we did on Unworks Barracuda system. Uh, with a focus this time on characterizing the fluid parameters um, solution exchange and how the users could take advantage of the um, of these features to fully utilize the uh, capacity of the Barracuda system for applications such as adding multiple compounds into the same recording size into the patch pack well. So to further increase the throughput and to reduce the running cost. So a brief agenda here. Um, to level the ground for uh, some of the people who uh, may not be as familiar with the uh, Unworks Barracuda system, I'll spend the first couple of minutes to give a brief uh, introduction to the instrument design and also to um, highlight the unique design of the patch plate or the consumable uh, uh, configuration, which is critical to understanding the uh, um, solution exchange feature on the Barracuda system. And also, I'll um, show you uh, two different sets of studies where we characterize the uh, solution exchange rate and the completeness of the solution exchange um, with the idea to understand the ability of the Barracuda system to um, deliver fast and accurate uh, compound additions. Um, for pharmacology type of assays. Uh, the last part of the uh, talk will be focusing on a case study using a real um, channel, um, the herb channel in this case, um, and to study the pharmacology of the herb channels using both a cross plate type of uh, um, design, which is similar to a flipper type of experimentation, and also a vision well type of design to um, look at the um, pharmacology in a cumulative fashion. Um, so I'll show you the data that um, compares the two different sets of uh, experiments. So without further ado, the Ironworks Barracuda system is an automated patch clamp system uh, that is built onto its predecessor Ironworks Partial system. It has um, continuous voltage clamps, which enables uh, simultaneous compound addition and data acquisition at the same time. And this allows the Barracuda system to record uh, even fast distance typing ligand data on channels, uh, shown in here as an example of nicotinic silicon uh, receptor. Um, the Barracuda system um, stands out as the first um, high throughput instrument uh, for automated electrophysiology that has 384 um, patch clamp amplifiers and uh, uh, 384 channel pipettes to serve um, 384 independent recording sites. So parallel data acquisition in all recording sites, all patch plate wells. Uh, there's no multiplexing in on the um, Barracuda system. Example shown here is uh, real data from the Barracuda system showing uh, recording of the herb channels in the TPC mode where you see not only 100% success rate, but also very high uniformity of the signals across the plate, which is uh, enabled by the uh, population patch clamp. I will uh, get into some detail in the coming slide. The Barracuda system uses a proven polyimide film planner uh, uh, patch consumable, uh, meaning the substrate is the same as being used on the uh, um, uh, iron quattro system. So the, uh, um, the, the, the the consumable price is really low. And also, the Barracuda system allows for unlimited compound additions per wall. Uh, this is the focus of the talk today, as in the case today with the herb channel, where people can do their pharmacology in the cumulative fashion, uh, adding uh, 
extrapolating uh, concentrations of the same compound into the uh, uh, each recording site, and it gets accumulated um, those response terms for each compound um, uh, at 384 parallel recording sites. Um, the Barracuda system also features a very uh, powerful and versatile software, uh, which allows uh, a higher, very high flexibility in terms of asset development um, for the user. So the way this is achieved is for each assay on the Barracuda system, it is broken down to uh, three different sections on the software, where you have a setup circle, which essentially gets you from uh, priming the instrument to um, the wholesale, or in this case, the perfect attached uh, uh, configuration. Um, so you have electric access to the cells uh, at the end of the uh, setup protocol. And then you start um, um, something we call the channel protocol, which is highly um, flexible uh, depending on the target of interest, um, and the cleanup protocol. The asset development mode allows you to cycle through different um, channel protocols. Um, after you uh, after the completion of the setup protocol, meaning the the user um, can choose to modify their existing uh, channel protocol or voltage protocol, or load a different protocol as many times as you want, or as long as the cells allows you um, to generate as much data as possible before moving on to the clean cleanup protocol to um, uh, get ready for the next next experiment. The other mode uh, of the uh, um, software is called a multiple protocol mode, where the customer uh, can predefine a number of uh, channel protocols uh, in series and run them sequentially and automatically by just uh, pressing the, uh, the button here. So this is very similar to the uh, sequencing K, which is well known, uh, a well-known feature in the PCAM software. And also, uh, the screening mode is uh, just running one channel protocol that the customer feels um, uh, that you like the best for, for their screening campaign. So you get your um, maximum, maximum throughput um, by doing uh, the, the uh, by running the, uh, the instrument in the screening mode. And also, the Barracuda system allows uh, two different um, uh, types of uh, experimentation with both a single whole substrate and what's called a population test uh, substrate. Essentially, um, the customer can choose to record signals from one single cell or um, a population of cells um, from each recording side. So you, have, uh, you can choose to either have the single cell resolution or you, have, you can have the, uh, the high success rate and the high uniformity from the uh, uh, population test type of uh, um, applications. So this is um, uh, zooming into the uh, uh, process stack of the Barracuda system, where you can see from the left to right, uh, there's um, positions for competitive, for the external buffer, for the compound plate, there's two of them, um, left and right. And in the center, you have the, uh, uh, the position for the uh, patch plate, which is the, uh, the consumable um, for, the, uh, for the Barracuda system, and the electrode plate, which um, uh, which is, uh, provides the, uh, the voltage command to the uh, to the uh, each recording site. Uh, here, there's a wash station which allows the tip, um, the disposable plastic tip, to be washed uh, in between experiments. So uh, there's no carryover of the compound uh, uh, from one experiment to the next. And on the right, there's uh, uh, devices for um, um, automatically uh, adding the cells into the into the cell boat and transfer the cells from the cell boat to the, to the patch plate. So uh, a few more pictures on the, uh, on the 384 wall uh, patch plate. So it has the uh, standard SBS um, 384 wall compound plate on the same footprint. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, each well or each recording site on the uh, patch plate is commanded by um, uh, one dedicated patch clamp amplifier through uh, one pin or one electrode pin uh, on, on the electrode plate. So there's a, 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 a 16 by 24 standard 384 uh, array of um, patch, uh, patch clamp electrodes on the electrode plate. And also, you see, next to the pin, there's an opening 
um, for, for each uh, for each recording site, which allows the uh, process to uh, travel through and serve the um, the this designated uh, uh, patch pack well. So the uh, the disposable path travels through the open flow here and uh, um, can either dispense cells or compound or buffers or whatever. And uh, um, the voltage clamp is um, <coughs> continuous, so you can uh, so you can uh, do continuous uh, recordings while doing your compound addition. Um, this is critical um, to allow the recording of files to desensitize in ligand exam channels, for example. The, uh, this is an illustration of the uh, uh, patch plate configuration. There are two different types. One is a single hole plate, where uh, there's one aperture or one recording, <coughs> uh, one hole for uh, recording of one single cell uh, at each uh, each wall or each recording site. Um, so this gives you the single cell resolution that's very important in doing applications uh, like clonal selection or to, um, for some diagnostic purpose in understanding the distribution of the cells or the uh, expression levels um, among different cells. The other uh, type of plate is the population patch clamp plate, or PTC plate, we call them. Um, so there are multiple holes, in this case, uh, a total of 64 holes um, per, per well or per recording site. So you're recording uh, ensemble current or ensemble signal from a total of 64 cells. Um, and that average the signals. Uh, so the final um, readout is the average of the uh, uh, six to four, uh, of the current from six to four cells, and that gives you the, uh, the very high success rate, close to 100 percent, and very high uniformity of the signal as you have seen on the previous slide. So the patch plate is very uniquely designed. Um, uh, we call it a flow-through type of design, and this is crucial in understanding the fluidic parameters of the barricade system. Uh, so shown here is a cross-section of one patch plate wall, and you can see basically there's um, a top chamber, a bottom chamber, and two entry points, one for the uh, electrode, cash current electrode, and the other one for the uh, um, disposable pipette tips to come, come into the, uh, uh, the patch plate walls. The bottom chamber is where the cell is. Actually, the cell is situated uh, right underneath the uh, the, um, the the pipette tip. So <coughs> this allows the uh, the pipette to be very close to the uh, uh, to the cells. And when it is pass uh, dispense compound or uh, or ligand, um, the exposure of the uh, cells to the uh, um, to the to the ligand is maximized. And this is crucial uh, for fast and accurate, accurate application of compounds uh, to cells. So the bottom chamber here is uh, only about 1.5 microliter in, in volume, and uh, uh, the, uh, the combination of the bottom and the upper chamber, um, the total volume in the, each patch plate well is about 61 microliter. Uh, in addition to, the, uh, to this design, there's a funnel guide uh, in the patch plate well which will help align the positioning of the uh, patch plate tips into the patch plate wall. So the, uh, so the uh, uh, positioning of the, uh, um, the tips in each wall is very well uh, controlled. Um, when you add compound from the pipette tips, uh, it flows through one end of the, of the wall to the other. So it's kind of a flow through uh, design, which uh, is similar to the uh, perfusion system where the, uh, the, the, the the compound of the ligand goes from one end of the chamber to the other. Um, the user can define from the software the speed and the height of aspiration or distance, and uh, after each compound addition, the fluid level is maintained by um, um, by by um, the way the fashion is done is the uh, um, before the second compound addition, the volume of the previous, uh, previous added compound was removed before you add the second compound. So the fluid level is always maintained at constant level. So makes it, uh, the, makes it easier to perform multiple compound additions uh, at the same uh, recording site. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, two different uh, studies where we characterize the, uh, the rate and the completeness of the social interchange using uh, biophysical uh, uh, techniques. The first one was to characterize the solution exchange rate by using a KV channel, a potassium channel, uh, 1.3 in this case. 
Uh, the way we do this uh, experiment is we use a voltage protocol like this, um, a step protocol where we uh, step from a uh, holding potential of minus 70 to uh, plus 20 millivolts to drive the channel from closed state to open state. And as you can see, as a response, this is the, uh, the current recorded from the uh, KV1.3 channel in response to this voltage protocol. As you can see, once the channel opens, it shows very slow in activation, so uh, it's fairly flat towards the end of the recording. And at one point, we would add the um, uh, a buffer containing a different um, potassium concentration, a high potassium channel, uh, potassium buffer. And the way, uh, <clears throat> when we do this, it changes the driving force of the um, of the uh, of the potassium current. However, without uh, without um, without the complication from the uh, the gating mechanism of the channel, so the channel still remains open. However, but, uh, with the driving force change, um, with the high uh, potassium buffer added into the uh, into the into the patch grid walls, you are reducing the driving force of the potassium current, and as a result, you will see a reduction of the uh, potassium current. So by monitoring the rate of the decline of the potassium current, we can actually calculate the rate of the solution exchange. And this is a pure uh, measurement of the solution exchange because it takes away the biology or the gating mechanism uh, from the uh, analysis. So when we do this type of assay, um, and we zoom in this, um, this uh, section of the uh, uh, reporting, you get something like this, where the current uh, originally was at this level, 5 nano or 5 nano in this case. And then after the solution exchange, it uh, decays. And then the current drops to about uh, 2 nano amperes. And uh, by looking at the, the, the kinetics of the, uh, the, the decay, we can calculate the, uh, the 10 to 90 decay, decay time, which represents the solution exchange rate. In this case, the 10 to 90 degree time is only 39 milliseconds, so it's very, very fast. Now, of course, uh, under different conditions, the, uh, depending on the height and the, uh, and the dispensing speed, the um, solution exchange rate varies. And in this table, it summarized uh, the conditions, uh, um, under different conditions, the, uh, the, the numbers for the uh, uh, decay time, so single hole. A low height and fast dispensing speed gives us the, uh, the maximum, the, the fastest solution exchange rate, uh, under 14 milliseconds. In PPC, it's uh, 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 about twice as, uh, uh, as, uh, as long. So, with this fast solution exchange rate, we can really um, um, tackle the, uh, the fast distance saving of ligand ion channels. As well now, the ligand ion channels are known for their um, um, this characteristic of um, uh, desensitization, meaning the channel uh, would close very rapidly in some cases, um, even in the presence of the ligand. So, uh, once, the, once the example is an actinic acetylcholine receptor, uh, the affluent um, type of an actinic uh, receptor are uh, open and close in milliseconds, and this is uh, the real reporting from the barracuda system it, where you can clearly resolve the, uh, the fast desensitizing ligand ion channels. In comparison, there are other channels that yeah, desensitize a little slower, like affluent actinic receptor and GABA, a GABA channel. And in zooming of the uh, alpha-7 exchange receptor, uh, the 10 to 90 uh, rise time of the channel is about uh, only 5.4 milliseconds. So it's really, really challenging to uh, record this um, this current. And the, uh, and the uh, uh, current, uh, and the, 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 the channel uh, completely closed within about uh, 15 to 20 milliseconds. So to be able to record the alpha-7 exchange receptor on the barracuda system confirms that uh, the fluidic uh, exchange rate on the system is um, sufficient to um, uh, analyze even the, the you know the fastest desensitizing ligand ion channel. So um, another theory of uh, studies we did is to look at uh, the completeness of the solution, uh, solution exchange, which is also crucial in uh, in some college assays. You know, if you want to have accurate delivery of the compound, and uh, you want to have precise control of the compound uh, over the course of the, uh, uh, the the compound concentration over the course of the recording. So to address this um, uh, concern, we uh, um, 
derives that, not a series of uh, experiments, uh, also using the KV1.3. But in this case, we um, will design a study based on the non C equation. Uh, as we know, the non C equation, uh, as shown, shown here, it says that the, the um, reversal potential or the, or the membrane potential average, the current is zero, so the, the, the current through so the channel is at zero nanometers. The, uh, the, the reversal potential is dictated by the, uh, um, the ratio of the, uh, um, the ions um, outside and inside of the, uh, uh, inside of the cell. So in this case, it's showing the reverse potential of the potassium channel, uh, EK, and that's dictated by the, uh, um, the, the ratio of the, uh, um, the potassium ions outside and inside of the cells. In this study, we use uh, constant um, concentration of the uh, potassium ion uh, intracellularly at 140 millimolar. So by varying the, uh, the, the potassium concentrations uh, in the external solution, we can um, change the uh, the reverse potential of the uh, of the potassium channel. So um, a voltage protocol uh, is designed to look like this. Um, again, we host the cells at minus 70 millivolts, and then use this step protocol to drive the channel into the open state. And then uh, the step protocol is followed by a ramp uh, step, where the channel is um, driven. Um, the current is driven from uh, being outward. Uh, this is this is a voltage protocol. This is the actual recorded current. The channel, uh, once it's open, the current um, <coughs> can be driven from um, um, outward to inward um, because of the, uh, the, the uh, in response to this run protocol. Okay, and we're looking for the the point where the channel is uh, or the channel current is crossing the zero nanoampere line. So this is uh, what we call the apparent uh, reversal potential. Right, so this value indicates the membrane potential at which the current is at zero, and this is the reverse potential as um, defined in the non equation. The reason we choose to do such a study is um, by doing uh, analysis of the solution exchange components using non equation, we can bypass a few complicating uh, issues with doing some college with real compound and real ion channels. Uh, in the way, you know, uh, in, a, in a pharmacology analysis, some uh, people often, often um, uh, would encounter um, the complications from the rundown of the ion channel, uh, the desensitization of the channel over time, you know, stability of the cells, uh, and the impact of the cells stability on the quality of the data. <clears throat> and also the compound properties in terms of solubility, hydrophobicity, uh, and stability, etc. And in addition to um, ion channels and compound um, by themselves, there's channel and compound interactions. So if you do real compound with, um, with real compound, <coughs> these uh, are the issues you have to worry about. But by doing a biophysical kind of analysis, looking at the reversal potential, the only thing you, want to, you need to control is the, uh, um, the potassium uh, ion concentration in the actual buffer. And that should give you a very clean analysis of the uh, reverse potential without uh, the complicating factors of having compound in the system. So um, the design of the experiment is like this. So we're trying to look for the, uh, how complete the solution exchange can be achieved on the circuit system. And the, the way we do this <coughs> is um, we start by um, doing some baseline recordings of the potassium current using the voltage protocol um, described here. And then at um, the end of the baseline recording, we will switch the external um, buffer from low potassium uh, solution to high potassium solution. And then we will switch back and, and switch to high concentration. And we'll do this multiple times. So to understand, um, by monitoring the, uh, the changes, the reverse potential, we can, we can uh, get a very good understanding of how complete the uh, solution change is. Uh, in this particular experiment, we're dispensing a volume of 20 microliters of the uh, maximum buffer of different potassium concentration into the uh, patch plate. And uh, I remember the uh, the bottom chamber of the patch plate is about 1.5 microliter. So 20 micro microliters should sufficiently replace the volume in the bottom chamber. Well, the cell says, um, 
more than 10 times. So what does a result look like? So this is showing you the reversal potentials um, <coughs> um, measured at um, different external uh, uh, buffer, different uh, external potassium concentrations. So starting from a, a low concentration of external buffer, you have the reverse potential at a more uh, hypopolarized potential. And then once you switch to high external buffer, um, which is equivalent to the um, to the concentration in the internal buffer, the reverse potential is about zero millivolts as predicted by the Nance equation. And once you switch back, you have complete um, <coughs> um, reversal of the, uh, of the uh, reversal potential back to the original value, and you can do this multiple times. In this case, we have done it for seven times. So, and, and uh, um, at the end of the uh, uh, experiment, when you do the, the group T test, so the uh, reverse potential measured at different, uh, at the two different sets of um, uh, solution and concentration, you get the uh, very similar data. So the, the T test shows there's no statistical difference between the reverse potential measured, you know, um, you know, it's the first or the fourth uh, <coughs> exchange of solutions with the same concentration of potassium. And, and so, as, as a control, when you add only the same concentration of potassium um, buffer into the uh, uh, into the patch plate uh, for the uh, for, for the seven times, you have a very stable uh, radar of the uh, uh, reverse potential. Uh, within each um, solution addition or buffer addition and also across experiments. So very stable recording, so the very accurate um, measurement of the uh, uh, reverse potential, showing you that, that the solution exchange can be, uh, can be um, <coughs> reversed completely. So uh, the, the, the solution in, the, in this case um, is a potassium buffer. But um, in a real pump uh, carriage assay, it be a compound. So the, uh, the indication of the, the, from this study is you can actually accurately control the, um, the, the compound concentration or solution concentration in the patch plate models by doing a flow through type of application. So uh, <coughs> moving on to the last part of the, uh, <coughs> the talk, excuse me. <coughs> where we use a, a real arm channel, a herb channel, and uh, analyze the, uh, the thumb coverage of the herb channel by using two different types of um, experiment, experiment design. Uh, one is the cross plate um, <coughs> type of design, one is the within well, multiple compound addition type of design. So this is again showing you a PTC recording of the baseline current um, of the herb channels, showing you the high uniformity and the high success rate of the um, of the recording at 384 uh, recording size. Um, and uh, when you add the compound in a cross plate fashion, meaning in each well or each recording site, you're only adding one concentration of the compound, and you're comparing the response of the, uh, <coughs> the compound um, in a cross plate fashion, you're normalizing the, uh, the you know, in a way, the, uh, the response of the, of the uh, compound to the, to the control. Uh, where no compound is added, um, first in a flipper uh, type of, type of um, fashion. And as you can see in this experiment, there's increasing concentration of inhibitor uh, a fifth supply in this case, uh, you will see the uh, uh, dose dependent um, reduction of the third current. The third current, uh, you know, um, the thing that we're looking at is this, uh, this uh, tail current, as uh, my, my mouse uh, is pointing at. So with increasing concentration of the, um, the, the blocker, you will see the, the gradual reduction of the uh, herd current um, in, uh, in a very clear uh, dose-dependent fashion. And you can plot out the uh, dose response curve um, into something like this. This is um, the data um, um, <coughs> they analyze using seven different uh, reference compounds for herd channels. And Thank you. And not only the, uh, um, the, you can get very nice dose response, you can also look, uh, have uh, very tight recordings um, uh, when comparing the recordings from different 
days of different experimentation. So this table shows you the uh, this this graph shows you um, the distribution of the ISO 50 values um, collected from eight different experiments. And you can see you know, the graph here for each compound represents ISO 50 values collected from uh, one different experiment, and they're all um, buried. So showing you a high consistency of the um, <coughs> of the pharmacological um, have the unbiotic system or what different experiments or what different things. And also when comparing the farm college values of the Barracuda uh, assay for the first channel um, to the classical assay, this is historical data. Um, <coughs> you can see the uh, the correlation is actually very nice. You know, there's there are always things we sent uh, three X uh, of the standard standard deviation. And there is no clear indication of the um S C C values measured on that uh, being either left or right shifted on the on the uh, um compared with the partial value. So uh, the data are very, very comparable. So how do we do this in a multiple compound addition way? So the the this is taking advantage of the ability of the Barracuda to allow the user to add multiple concentrations of the compound into the same patch bank well. So in this study, um, also with the herb channels, um, the compound was added um, in such a way that each well receives escalating concentration of the same compound. So there are a stack of compound plate, each with asking concentration of the same compound. And the potency is, is um, of the of the fungi is analyzed in a uh, by doing a cumulative fashion of um, uh, those response curves, uh, which is similar to most people do with the conventional patch plan. And but this allows you to generate up to 384 compound um, in those response curves in about a 30 minutes, a 30 minute long experiment. So uh, this is some of the uh, the quality control experiment we did beforehand, where we look at the uh, the the stability of the seals the, and the stability of the current over time. Uh, this is in the absence of adding compound, um, but uh, in this case, the, the compound addition was was uh, was just buffer. So looking at the stability of the uh, seals and, and, and current over six additions, um, and it's fairly stable actually over time. And um, uh, this is a voltage protocol, and this is an uh, example showing the the time dependent and the concentration dependent uh, reduction of the uh, herd current um, but, uh, in the presence of the S time of the child block. So uh, this is the real data showing you um, the, the dose response curve for seven different uh, reference compounds, the same seven compounds we used before in a cross, cross section, and uh, um, showing the dose response uh, uh, of the uh, herd channel block um, by by this compound, um, the, the, the dose response curve looks slightly different because there's only six points per uh, dose response curve, not eight, uh, as shown in the uh, earlier slide. And uh, this is showing the scatter of the uh, of the data across different experiments uh, from different days. Um, they all look reasonably okay, except for the uh, demo side, which is probably um, because of the uh, high hydrophobicity of the uh, of of this compound as indicated by the high C log T value. And when you compare the uh, um, IC50 values uh, collected from uh, this within well fashion or multiple compound addition into the same well fashion and across the cross fashion, again, they are very similar. There is not a statistical, statistical difference between the uh, uh, IC50 values um, generated using either method. So, in summary, um, what I want to show you today is uh, the Iron um, Works Barracuda system, um, for the first first time, provides continuous voltage uh, clamp on 300 info um, parallel recording sites. There's no multiplexing that allows for continuous recordings during compound addition for lightning ground channels, even the fast defense lightning lightning ground channels recording. We can do very rapid, sorry, we can do very rapid solution exchange uh, in the recording wells to capture the fast desensitizing lagging ground channels. And we can also complete with, completely um, <coughs> exchange the solutions in the chamber so we can uh, assure the, uh, the, the precise farm college by um, pre, you know, having good control of the, uh, uh, of the uh, 
come from the delivery. Uh, if you use multiple compositions uh, into a single, uh, you know, in the, in the first some college assays, it generally is the same as if it's a or the first the same uh, some colleges um, to the uh, cross plate some college assay. Uh, and they each have their own advantages uh, in, the, in, in the way that cross plate type of design uh, would allow you to do as many concentrations as you want uh, for your dose response curve. So it augments the confidence level of the, of the curve setting. And also, uh, each um, experiment is done in the cross plate fashion. It's only about 20 minutes long, so it's very short. As the runtime time uh, to minimize, um, you know, artifacts such as turn run down. The benefit of doing the within well uh, or multiple compound addition per well uh, type of experiment is it, um, it actually uh, reuses the same cells and generates uh, a lot more data points per assay. So it reduces uh, the cost of consumables and running costs and significantly uh, increases throughput. And as the, uh, the current assay um, data show, uh, that there's uh, the some college uh, numbers actually match really well with the cross plate uh, type of experiments. So uh, the, uh, the user can um, decide whichever works for them um, uh, for their specific assay. So with that, I will uh, say thanks to my colleagues at the uh, Molecular Devices, uh, Karen Turk, Edward Dunn, Jim Constantin, and Peter Neal. And also we want to thank uh, Chantas for providing the cell lines uh, we used for this study. And uh, I'll finish here, and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Shin, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say to the attendees, we are monitoring the, the Q&A tab on the, um, on the WebEx, and we will be... Um, we will have a question session at the end. So if you have questions, please use that Q&A tab, not the, not the chat tab. And um, we'll be handing it over to Glenn Kirsch here in just a minute. Um, so Glenn, I'm unmuting you um, and passing you the, the ball. So again, the, the Q&A session will be at the end. And um, uh, today we're going to be talking about our experiences using Ironworks Barracuda looking at uh, multiple members of the anatomic GABA receptor family. And uh, we are developing assays and primarily for doing uh, profiling and looking at a little bit of mechanism of action uh, in, this, in this family of uh, ligand-gated channels. So the GABA receptors then are uh, pentameric structures that have uh, you know, two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and uh, an auxiliary, uh, either gamma or delta subunit. The uh, binding sites then for the GABA ligand that are at the intersection between the alphas and the betas, and then there's also uh, uh, potentiator sites uh, such as the benzodiazepine site between uh, gamma and alpha subunit. And then the overview uh, from the top uh, looks, looks like this. The central cavity then is the pore for chloride transport, for chloride movement, uh, which uh, gives uh, the inhibitory effect of hyperpolarizing the, the membrane. We uh, developed cell lines then uh, for five of the, uh, five of the uh, GABA subtypes, uh, the alpha-1 through alpha-5, uh, in combination with uh, beta-3 and gamma-2 in each case. The alpha-1s then are the major subtype and uh, correspond to 60% of the receptors in the CNS. And uh, they're uh, important pharmacologically because uh, they can be uh, used in, uh, uh, because they have the effect of sedation or anesthetic. Uh, 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 anticonvulsants. Uh, they have high benzodiazepine affinity and, and silphidem affinity as well. Alpha-2 is a uh, less uh, frequently encountered subtype uh, anxiolytic uh, applications. Uh, also has a high benzodiazepine affinity and, and intermediate silphidem uh, affinity. Alpha-3s through alpha-4s are, are minor subtypes. Uh, I point out in particular that uh, uh, some of them are um, Insensitive to benzodiazepine like the alpha fours, and, uh, and so they have differences in their sensitivity to the uh, the ligand. So some of these, uh, so some of this pharmacology then uh, is what we want to recapitulate in our recombinant cell lines and verify uh, in, in cell line validation that has the appropriate uh, characteristics. So we're 
using uh, the Ironworks Barracuda, and you've already seen uh, how this one works. Uh, essentially, it's a miniaturized uh, uh, version of uh, manual patch planting with automated uh, solution up, uh, additions. And um, we're using the instrument, the Barracuda instrument, in both the uh, single hole mode uh, in some of the cell line development steps, and then we're also using it primarily in the assay development uh, Step for uh, doing, uh, we're, we're using it in the, in the population patch PPC mode uh, for um, uh, assay development. Uh, the uh, the instrument then uh, has has a fairly high throughput, and when we're doing profiling studies, what we find is that we can do up to ten plates per day. So if we're running this thing in an eight point uh, concentration response curve. But with more replicates per concentration, we have the ability then to uh, to uh, do profiling of 100 compounds per day, and we can run through you know 500 compounds uh, per week per target. And uh, if we're profiling all five of the subtypes that we have, uh, it would take about five weeks to, to complete that uh, type of profiling study. Um, and of course, a screening study then would have with a single point mode would have much higher higher uh, uh, throughput. The characteristic uh, features of the ironworks Starcuda that we use in, in this uh, series of assays uh, is, uh, is, of course, the continuous voltage clamp capability and compound addition during recording and uh, the high throughput. We're not using the multiple compound addition uh, in, this, in this series of experiments, so that uh, we're running the experiments, running the assays, uh, essentially in the, in the cross cross-plate design that uh, Jen referred to uh, earlier. So this is the strategy that we use in cell line development and uh, then following up with, uh, with assay development. So in the cell line development, uh, overall, uh, this can take uh, at least three months uh, to get a stable cell line in place. And uh, there's a number of steps that we have to go through in order to uh, have it validated. Uh, obviously, we need to uh, ex do confirmation of expression, and we typically would do that with uh, RT-PCR uh, analysis of the mRNA and functional cell-based assays. Uh, in this case, uh, ironworks Barracuda. In some instances, we can do some uh, some uh, antibody uh, confirmation in Western blood. Uh, the uh, optimization then includes uh, looking at uh, cell growth characteristics and some basic functional testing to make sure that the stimulus response uh, is, is, is correct and that we have some, uh, some basic pharmacology to uh, uh, characterize the cell line. Then moving into the assay development stage, what we want to eventually have is an assay that's uh, suitable for uh, automation and uh, medium throughput studies, either in screening mode or, or uh, profiling mode. And so I'll be talking about a little bit of some of, uh, just a kind of a, a, a general, uh, uh, some of the, the general results we, we have in this, in this, uh, in this process of uh, early stage development and uh, validation. Uh, the early stage, of course, we're going to be optimizing recording conditions, adjusting stimulus parameters, uh, and uh, testing stimulus response. We want to uh, look at uh, such things as uh, uh, the signal window of deep prime the MSO tolerance. In the assay validation stage, we look more closely at uh, plate uniformity and stability of the signal and uh, variability uh, within the days and then between runs on different days and looking at some reference pharmacology. So let's start by looking at some of the steps that uh, we took to uh, optimize our cell lines, validate our cell lines. I'll show some examples. Uh, uh, so this is an example of the alpha-2 uh, subtype of the GABA receptor. Um, and what we did was to uh, uh, develop the, the cell line, and then we froze it down at passage 30. And then what you're looking at here is some of the stability um, and some of the functional characteristics um, for a series of post thaw passages, about, about 10 passages. So for each of the passages, so at, at various stages, at various passages post-thaw, then we did some RT-PCR, and this just shows you some of the uh, some of the controls and some of the results from that. You can see that when we probe with uh, sub sub 
uh, unit specific probes for the alpha sub unit, the alpha two, we get a good signal. Uh, beta three is there, and uh, the gamma two is, is, is clearly present. When we look at uh, the uh, functional characteristics, here in the Barracuda is running in a single cell mode. What we see is that uh, we have uh, a, a dispersion of uh, single cell results. Um, Indicating that uh, there are some cells in the in the mix that have very high levels of expression, let's say in the range of 10 nanoamps, but most of the cells are in the range of uh, about two and a half nanoamps, and there's a few that don't show much expression. So there's a, a dispersion then that you would measure in, in single cell mode, in a single whole mode, um, and so we can reduce the the dispersion then by recording in the population patch plant mode where you're looking at averages of cells in each unit, 64 cells in each in each well. And when you do that, uh, the mean uh, current becomes uh, distributed in a, in a Gaussian fashion around the uh, 2.1 nanoamp uh, average. And uh, <laughs> the uh, well, essentially in, in this in this histogram, essentially this histogram shows that there are no failures, that there's 100% uh, success rate. There's all, all, of the, all of the recordings are uh, at, least, uh, at least 500 picoamps, so half to 3.5 nanoamps. And then the stability of the cell line is shown here, where we're looking at the post-thaw passages uh, 4, 8, and uh, 11. And you can see that uh, the average current in population patch plant mode remains uh, consistent throughout that time. So at this at this point, then uh, we can do some pharmacology, uh, but we feel that we have established the uh, stability, and we've done this then for the other um, subtypes that we've looked at as well. So during the assay development process, we want to set up some electrophysiological parameters uh, for each well. And uh, these are in the form of uh, electrical measurements uh, from the from the barracuda. We're looking for steel resistance that's greater than 50 megohms, uh, current amplitude uh, greater than 200 picoamps, steel uh, steel re uh, re resistance stability with uh, some characteristic uh, uh, parameters for rundown and and stability of the current amplitude. I'm looking for voltage off, low voltage offsets, and uh, we can do some uh, visual control for glitches that might uh, influence the quality of the data. Uh, we also do plate level parameters, and here we're looking at uh, uh, dynamic range uh, and variability through the Z, fac Z prime factor, and we're looking for values uh, at least 0 0.4. We can look at the uh, coefficient of variability uh, for values less than 20% for the maximum control, the minimum control uh, CV less than 20%, looking for signal windows greater than 2, and some uh, pharmacology that, uh, it, that uh, doesn't vary from our historic means. And we're looking, of course, for success rates and, and PPC mode uh, greater than 95%. The way we set up the ligand-gated assays in Ironworks uh, is that we're Using in this series of experiments, uh, the background cell, the parent cell is HK293. Uh, we can also we can do either stably or transiently transfected cells, but uh, around uh, 20 million cells per plate. And we're doing eight point concentration response uh, where we have 320 wells of uh, test compound available, 320 wells available for test compound, and then we have. Uh, 64 wells per vehicle and positive controls. We're doing two additions in, this, in these experiments. Uh, the first addition is, uh, in most cases, is to pre-incubate with the test compound for five minutes. And uh, we can do this with simultaneous recording, and so we can detect uh, effective, the Agnes effect of, of test compounds. Then the second addition, we would uh, apply the, uh, the ligand for one second at uh, high rate, uh, adjustable rate, and uh, uh, look at the, the effect uh, of the uh, test compound then on, on the uh, activation by the, by the ligand. So we can do either in a uh, either by setting the ligand concentration to a maximum concentration, look for inhibition by the test compound, or we can 
uh, set the, uh, the concentration of the ligand at, uh, say, the EC20 and for uh, positive uh, modulation. And we can, all, we, we can also uh, run, the, uh, run the experiment uh, without pre-incubation, but just do a baseline read with the vehicle and then add the ligand together with the test compound and look at uh, the time course of uh, the kinetic uh, effects. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you some data later on that uh, looks at that. So here's an example of uh, the other currents. Um, in a concentration response mode where the top half of the plate uh, goes from 0 0.3 micromolar to uh, 1 millimolar, and that just repeats in the bottom half of the plate. These are the current uh, readings from the, from the wells where we alternate between uh, application of GABA and vehicle control in these columns. And then the, uh, <coughs> the hit map from, from this sort of experiment where we've uh, colored in green uh, current amplitudes that exceed 50% uh, activation threshold. And then you can get an idea, and you can, so the, un, uh, so the, the blank uh, wells uh, are below that threshold, and you can see the vehicle control wells here. You also see that there, there are some wells that don't give valid results, and those are filtered out um, by the parameters that we set in our filters. So that you could have uh, block wells, uh, you could have wells that don't have seals. And you could have some rejected wells uh, for uh, reasons of um, the amplitude being below the low threshold or some uh, uh, disturbance, some glitch in the, in the recording. But overall, the success rate in this type of experiment is typically greater than 95%. You can see it's 95.5% here, and uh, the same time values are, are acceptable. So this, this is a uh, Experiment where this is just an example of the uh, of the actual uh, traces and higher uh, higher magnification uh, in ascending concentrations of, of GABA, and this is the uh, GABA response curve for the alpha two uh, subunit, and uh, our EC fifty value is around six micromolar in this experiment. This gives you an idea of the variability that we can within within an experiment. If we look at, if we do the same experiment, we're looking at, at all the uh, GABA subtypes that we have in our cell lines. Uh, we have a one, alpha 1 through alpha 5. You can see that uh, there's a cluster of concentration response measurements where there's not much difference between the subtypes, and that's uh, clearly the case for uh, the uh, most sensitive subtypes, alpha 2, uh, alpha 4, and alpha 5. They all have a you know, EC50 value of around 5 micromolar. Uh, where you see an intermediate uh, concentration response uh, is for the alpha-1, and the least sensitive uh, subtype is the alpha-3. And you can see that uh, the, this agrees very well with the literature values that uh, have, been, have been reported in RC prime range for these experiments. It's, it's quite good. Well, we can also do uh, allosteric uh, modulation, and uh, this is an example of uh, benzodiazepine diazepam uh, acti acting on the alpha-2 uh, subunit. And so in this experiment, we have our control wells, where we're looking at ascending concentrations of the ligand, GABA, and then in, in the same ascending concentrations of the ligand in the presence of the, uh, allosteric, of the, of the positive allosteric modulator at one micromolar. And you can see here that in the concentration response curves, what the diazepam uh, does is to, to shift the potency of, of GABA towards uh, a lower concentration, so higher affinity in the presence of diazepam uh, in excess of 0 0.1 micromolar. So we have an assay that can detect uh, diazepam uh, potentiation, and uh, we can look uh, at differences in the sensitivity of the different subtypes to a diazepam by looking at the ratio of the GABA EC50 value in the absence of diazepam versus EC50 in the presence of diazepam. So when that ratio is 1, then essentially there's no modulation. If the ratio is uh, greater, than, greater than 1, then uh, diazepam is having a positive 
uh, effect. And you see that uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and alpha 5 all show uh, potentiation by diazepam. Alpha 4, uh, the ratio is about 1, and that's what you'd expect from a uh, subtype that is insensitive to uh, benzodiazepine, and that's consistent with, with what's known about the uh, pharmacology of the, of the different subtypes. We can also uh, do experiments where we're looking at uh, antagonist effects, and uh, picrotoxin and bifutiline were two of the uh, antagonists that we've uh, that we've characterized in our in our assays. And here, once again, we're looking at the alpha two subtype, and in plate view, then concentration response for the inhibitors going from 0 0.1 to uh, 300 micromolar in the top half of the plate, and then the bottom half of the plate, uh, just repeating that. And we're alternating columns between the vehicle control, picrotoxin, and uh, bicupulin. And what you uh, observe here in the shaded uh, wells is, is a um, inhibition greater than uh, a 50 percent, that exceeds the 50 percent threshold. And this is what the uh, the currents look like in the presence of the vehicle without inhibition. And then uh, after say three micromolar picrotoxin and the current uh, three micromolar bicupulin. And these experiments were done with uh, pre-incubation of the test compound. So uh, it gives an idea of what, they, what the uh, currents look like in that type of experiment. When we uh, compare the uh, inhibitor potencies then for the different subtypes, we get uh, not very much uh, selectivity amongst the, the subtypes, which is consistent with, with the uh, uh, published results, picotoxin uh, giving uh, around between 10 and, and uh, uh, 16 micromolar IC50s, bicupulene uh, in the range of uh, you know, 2 to 5 uh, micromolar IC50s for all the, all the subtypes. We can run the experiment, the antagonist experiment, uh, without pretreatment, without pre-incubation. And uh, look at uh, whether there are differences between these two types of inhibitors in terms of their uh, kinetic response by applying the ligand GABA uh, at, e at the EC uh, at the EC80 concentration at the same time as we uh, uh, apply the inhibitor at varying concentrations. So this is the um, uh, concentration range that we're using for both inhibitors, and then. Top and bottom are, are repeats, and then the uh, alternating columns uh, with picrotoxin or bicupulene. We have two plate maps here. One is looking at uh, the results from the peak, from just analyzing the peak currents, and then in this plate view, we're looking at uh, what uh, the analysis shows us if we take the mean current uh, up to uh, one second after uh, after application of the um, of the inhibitor. And the increase then in the number of hits, say comparing this, comparing uh, uh, comparing these columns with these columns, uh, is indicative of the fact that uh, some, for some inhibitors like picrotoxin, uh, because it acts as an open channel blocker, then uh, if you uh, measure the uh, uh, inhibition at later time points in the waveform that you get uh, greater inhibition than, uh, than if you look at earlier time points, say peak. So the peak versus the one second shows this uh, increase in potency. For bicupulene, which is not an open channel blocker, but is a uh, competitive inhibitor at the uh, liquid binding site, uh, you don't see very much um, change as you uh, change the analysis from peak to one second. And that's shown more clearly uh, in the uh, average dose response curves, where for picrotoxin, as you analyze uh, longer and longer time points, you get uh, this leftward shift of the, uh, of the concentration response curve, indicating higher uh, inhibition at uh, the longer times. For bicupulene, uh, you don't see that effect. So uh, to conclude then, uh, what we've done, established is that we have uh, five GABA uh, expressing cell lines that have the appropriate pharmacological response to agonists, GABA, antagonists, bicuculin, and picrotoxin, 
and a positive allosteric modulator. In this case, uh, uh, we've looked uh, in, in, in depth at, at, at diazepam. Uh, these cell lines then are, are suitable for uh, use in uh, ironworks barcuda, and uh, these are, are cell lines that are available uh, for sale as uh, uh, cell research, as research products. And we've also then developed assays that we can offer as services on the ironworks barcuda platform. Uh, is suitable for uh, functional assays in a uh, semi-high throughput mode uh, for both agonist, antagonist, and positive allosteric uh, experiments. And so we feel that this is a, a very useful, these will, are very useful assays to support selectivity profiling and uh, secondary screening in CNS discovery or uh, uh, safety research. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, acknowledge our Ironworks team. Uh, Yuri Kurashev leads the team, and these folks are uh, very important in uh, running the assays on a day-to-day -day basis. Our high-throughput director is Amir Dujic, who has uh, very, been very uh, instrumental in setting up the strategies uh, for doing uh, cell line and, uh, and assay validation. And of course, uh, Buzz Brown is the, uh, the chairman that uh, guides all of our guys all of our work. So with that, I'll turn it back to, uh, to Jim, and thank you for uh, attending the webinar. Okay, Glenn. Thank you very much. It's a very nice talk. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions here that we received on the Q&A tab, and if I can remind the attendees, please continue to send in the questions on the Q of A tab. If we don't get to them live today, we will, um, we will uh, answer them by email. Um, and I, Glenn, I do have a couple of questions for you here. Um, the first question is, um, have you done any optimization of your assays for single point screening? Right. Well, that's something we're very interested in doing because uh, we do have uh, we do have we have had requests for for doing single point measurements. Uh, what you saw in the presentation was uh, Z prime values uh, in excess of 0 0.4. We'd really like to optimize the assay to get uh, Z primes up to uh, 0 0.6. And uh, we achieve that in, in some instances, but not for all of the subtypes. So uh, it's really a matter of uh, adjusting the, and optimizing the assay conditions. I think the, the cell lines are certainly capable of, of providing that kind of uh, uh, dynamic range. Okay, thank you. There's one more question. Uh, one more question for you. Do you observe differences in the apparent positive inhibitors when, when you pre incubate versus simultaneous addition with ligand? Yeah, well, I think I think I addressed that uh, in in the uh, in the presentation. We do see for for open channel blockers like picotoxin that you know, there's clearly kinetics. That is, that the uh, the decay times that are uh, induced by blockers entering the open channel uh, show that uh, you get uh, much more blocked towards the end of the of the waveform than you do by looking just at the peak. So I think that's one of the big advantages of, of you running these assays in uh, in the barracuda because the simultaneous addition of a ligand together with the inhibitor uh, gives uh, the uh, can give the on rate for open channel blockers, whereas the pre incubation uh, you, you you lose that information. So I think that's uh, you know a great advantage of, of the instrument. Okay, Glenn. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll forward you any more questions that we get in um, to be answered by email. So thank you very much for your time today. And we'll go thank to you. a question from uh, for Shin. So Shin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, so the solution, solution exchange um, from the KV1.3 assay is 39 milliseconds. Um, can you explain how you can record uh, alpha-7 nicotinic receptors with a rise time of about 5 milliseconds? So I, I think this, uh, that's a good question. I think the, uh, the, um, the two numbers um, are actually reflect, reflect two different um, two different phenomena. The uh, solution exchange rate of the 39 milliseconds reflects 10 to um, or 90 percent of the, uh, uh, 10 to 90 percent of the, uh, um, the, the solution. Exchange time, meaning that uh, how long it takes to replace the solution the cells are exposed to uh, up to 90%. Um, 
But yeah, so um, and that's in absence of any any biology. Um, but for the uh, nicotine receptor, for the for the channel to activate, it doesn't uh, necessarily uh, need to have ninety percent of the uh, the the cell uh, surface to be um, you know exchanged with the uh, to be exposed to the ligand. So the uh, in a way the the the, the biology accelerates the uh, the response time. So that's why I think it takes less amount of time to record the uh, the um, the channel current. Okay, well, thank you very much. And um, there are some more questions for you, so I'll give those to you to be answered by, by email. And what, what we're going to do now is we'll leave the, the webinar open uh, so that people can send more uh, questions uh, by the Q&A tab. Um, we'll leave this open for about five minutes and just go ahead and send us any questions you have, and we'll answer them by email. So we want to thank you for attending our um, automated electric physiology webinar today. And we plan on having at least two more in this, this fall. So um, we're we're getting the customers lined up to to get some t uh, two more webinars this fall. So please stay tuned for that. And with that, we'll go silent here and leave this screen open so you can send us more uh, questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. <laughs>